Ah, Dark Forces 2. I told you I'd get around to playing it eventually. I mean, it hasn't been that long since my Dark Forces 1 video, right? Oh. Okay, so it's been just a little while since I made that Dark Forces 1 video, but I promise I am not to blame for that, okay? I have tried multiple times to do a video on this game, but let's just say Dark Forces 2 doesn't exactly like to play nicely with modern hardware. Finally! Alright, let's get this game going. Son of a bitch! Call me stupid or lazy if you like, but I gotta be honest, messing around with this game's settings to get to properly run on modern hardware is just so irritating that every single time I actually tried to start this game, I would just end up getting more and more annoyed until I'd end up just deciding to record something else instead. But hey, here I am and I have finally sat down and gone through the entirety of Dark Forces 2, and I am so happy I did because wow, I am shocked at how ahead of its time this game is. Now just for some basic context, Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight was released back in 1997 and is the sequel to the acclaimed Dark Forces 1 that released back in 1995, and is also the prequel to the more well-known Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. Now, Jedi Outcast was my first game of the series that I actually played because, for a long time, I never actually knew the Dark Forces games were prequels to Jedi Outcast because Outcast actually dropped the Dark Forces part of the name to make sure you knew this one was all about the Jedis. But getting back to the Dark Forces games, Dark Forces 1 came out kind of towards the end of the Doom clone era, allowing it to take all those lessons from those style of games to create something that was truly ahead of its time. The levels were creative and felt like real places and not like just random mazes that most Doom era games had, and it even had a pretty decent story with each level serving an important purpose outside just kill everything and escape. And this might not really seem like that big of a deal now, but remember, until Half-Life actually came on the scene, stories in a first-person shooter was kind of just a novelty and not really expected. Now, fast forward to 1997 and we have Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight. And we are now at the beginning of being able to create more complicated, true 3D environments, allowing games to have actually far more intricate designs and to stack rooms on top of one another in more interesting ways something that was really difficult to do for many game engines or flat out couldn't be done at all in games like Doom, which actually doesn't allow two sectors to coexist on the same XY space whatsoever. Dark Forces 2 uses a new game engine called the Sith Engine that is admittedly far more powerful than the Jedi Engine from Dark Forces 1, and with this stronger game engine, they were able to pretty much be unrestricted when it came to just the crazy level designs they were able to create. Unfortunately, someone really should have at least put some restrictions on them because my god, some of these levels about gave me a damn aneurysm at times. Oh come on man, where the fuck do I go? I mean some of these levels are straight up amazing for the time with just some insane features to them, while others are some of the most strangely designed and obtuse levels I have ever seen in a first person shooter. I mean, one level will have you scratching your head thinking what acid tripping fuck would ever create such a mess, while the next level will make you think this had to have been game of the year. Which, admittedly, after playing it, it probably deserves because for a game made in 1997, my god, is it just so ahead of its time in so many ways. LucasArts already showed they could create a solid first person shooter story when they made Dark Forces 1, but they really took it to the next level for Dark Forces 2. You see, most of the games that I played that came out around this time period were games like Quake, Doom, and Descent. All amazing games, but the story was pretty much non-existent in any of them. I mean, Quake 2 came out after Dark Forces 2, and though its gameplay is probably more fun, the story is just archaic compared to what Dark Forces 2 was able to pull off. I mean, not only does it have a good story with just awesome characters, but they even have a morality system that runs through your playthrough that changes the ending of the game. Something that's just crazy to think of for a game this old. Dark Forces 2 was also the first in the series that actually had lightsaber combat, as well as a wide assortment of force powers. And even with it all happening on a much older game engine, they feel far better implemented than Star Wars games that came out years later. Now unfortunately, with the good does come some bad, not only is it a royal pain in the ass to get running on new hardware, we also have to be honest here. This game is ugly. 
I don't normally like to hate on older games graphics. I always find that to be kind of a cheap shot considering it is an older game, but come on man, I mean just look at this dude. He's a badly textured mess. And the same goes for a lot of the environments too. Sure, Dark Forces 1 looks pretty dated now, but its pixel art still has a very charming feel to it that really matched that old school Star Wars feel so well, while this just looks like the exact opposite of charming. Now I will admit after playing through all 21 levels, and yes you heard me right, this game has 21 levels so this is going to be a pretty long video, but after going through the whole game I did start to warm up to the graphics just a little bit. But to be honest, that's probably just a Stockholm Syndrome talking. Now before we jump into the game itself, I should probably point out the elephant in the room, and that is the cutscenes. This is actually one of my favorite parts of this game, but is also a very dated one. You see, in the late 90s, a lot of games were experimenting with live action cutscenes due to just how ugly faces were in most 3D games at the time. Some of the most iconic uses of this came from games like the Command and Conquer series that actually continue to use live action cutscenes all the way up to their last game, Kane's Wrath in 2008. And yes, Kane's Wrath was the last Command and Conquer game, do not at me, I do not give a fuck what you have to say. <clears throat> anyway. Most games that use live action cutscenes try to be a little campy because back then no one really had access to A-list actors to fill the role, so trying to be too serious was just a recipe for a disaster. Now Dark Forces 2 is definitely campy at times, especially with its main villain Jarek, but unlike many of the failed live action games of the 90s, it feels like this one actually has some soul to it. Like, the actors are just really happy to be there and are genuinely just enjoying making the game. It's also surprising to see the actual quality of the scenes at times when all of it was only filmed in 6 days. I mean, it doesn't hurt that they also have access to the John Williams soundtrack because let's be real, John Williams makes everything better. Unfortunately, he is also copyrighted, so I'll be using other Star Wars game music where I can to try and get around that. It'll be a losing battle due to all the cutscenes, but hey. Fingers crossed. Now with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and start this game up and see is Dark Forces 2 still worth playing after all these years. So Dark Forces 2 takes place after the events of Episode 6, with the Rebellion just starting to gain a foothold. However, after the death of Palpatine, other Imperials and Dark Jedi have actually started on their own quest to take up the mantle of Emperor and rule the galaxy themselves. Of these new dark forces, a dark Jedi named Jarek has seized control of a large force of Imperials and along with his dark apprentices, he seeks something called the Valley of the Jedi. So pretty much just your standard MacGuffin that might possibly grant him unlimited power. So yeah, the Valley of the Jedi actually has a lot of cool lore explained mostly outside the game with it actually being the trapped souls of Jedi from long ago. Pretty metal if you ask me, but all you really need to know is that if Jarek finds it, well, things get bad. God damn, that's a big Star Destroyer. It's like the opening scene of Spaceballs. I hesitate. Strike me down. Okay, pause real quick, because on my first playthrough, I kind of blanked out for a second and thought this dude was Kyle's dad for a minute. Then after that, I thought this dude who died in the beginning was Kyle's dad because of Jarek saying, This dead man, Morgan Katarn, has the secrets to the Valley of the Jedi. But 
he's not talking about this dead man because Morgan Katarn has actually been dead for years now. And none of this is ever actually explained in game. Now there is a book called Dark Forces Rebel Agent that actually covers pretty much all of this and is a really cool story of the Empire actually framing Morgan Katarn's death on rebels while Kyle was still serving with the Empire. Until of course he finds out the truth from Jan and actually defects. But again, if you're not really a lore nerd, some of these plot points are kind of just all over the place. I mean, I guess so long as you know Kyle's dad is dead and his work he left behind will lead to the Valley of the Jedi, you're pretty much good to go, but still kind of confusing if you're coming into the game blind. Oh, and by the way, this dude's name is Q-Ron. He was good friends with your dad before he got beheaded, I guess. He also narrates the game for you and speaks to Kyle through the Force. Either way, Jarek uses the Force to read Ron's mind and find out that Morgan Katarn actually knew of the Valley of the Jedi's location. And my god, do I just love Jarek's over-the-top acting. It's just fucking great. Morgan Katarn! This dead man holds the Valley's location. Very intriguing. <laughs> I have no further use for you, old man. Whoa, 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 whoa. Go back and pause that footage again. I promise we will not keep doing this for every cutscene, but this right here is the first shown depiction of a purple lightsaber in Star Wars. Now, the first one created in lore was Jaina Solo's lightsaber in the book series The Young Jedi Knights, but this weird looking freaky as hell dude actually has the credit for the first live action purple lightsabers. So sorry Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> so that's the intro. A little confusing, but it does a good job at setting up the villains as well as the MacGuffin that Kyle needs to find before Jarek. And speaking of Kyle, he's over on a bar on Nar Shaddaa, watching old videos of him and his father waiting to meet a droid contact who actually might give him some clues as to who exactly killed him. After she died, your welfare and upbringing was the only thing I truly cared about. Touching. When someone desires information, they come to me. Don't waste my time, idiot. Tell me who killed my father. Patience. He is a dark Jedi. Jedi? Dark Jedi. He is known as Jerick. And he has great plans for the rebirth of the Empire. I'm not interested in petty political struggles. Well, you should be. Without going into too much detail, Jerick has been quite generous in his offerings. Unfortunately, you don't factor into them. But I am not without a heart. Familiar, yes. I found it in your dead father's home. You know, I actually really enjoy AT-88. I always have a thing for droids that are evil with just a little personality. Tell me what it is and these gentlemen won't have to indulge their darker side. The dark side? I've been there. Do your worst. Well, I suppose that concludes our business. I'm not interested in leaving. I have some business to conclude with your friend, 88. So 
So Dark Forces 2 levels are kind of strange in that a lot of times 2 or 3 levels are really just one level split into different parts. So instead of breaking down each short level, I'll instead just combine them at times in order to keep the flow a little nicer. We start right where that cutscene left off, with that Grand possibly making the smartest decision of his short life and just running away. Not that it really helped him that much. Now right off the bat you can see the Sith engine is a massive step forward compared to the old Jedi engine, and the gameplay is now somewhat close to that of a modern game. We actually have free aim instead of auto aim, even though auto aim is still an option. The world looks a lot more open and everyone in it is actually in 3D. Now if only all the characters didn't look so damn ugly. So unlike Dark Forces 1, Dark Forces 2 wastes no time into throwing you into the thick of things. I mean, you were getting jumped at all angles here, like the level designers were so impressed with their abilities to actually create different spaces, they just threw enemies in there to make you have to look at it more. Whoops. So yeah, Dark Forces 2 also includes a few non-hostile NPCs this time. However, I would not go all murder hobo on them if I was you, because the game actually keeps track of the civilians you kill, using a hidden morality system, and assigns you a light or dark side score for each mission. But to be honest, after these first two levels, I might change to a dark side playthrough anyway, because my god, are these some of the worst intro levels to almost any shooter I have ever played. I mean, Nar Shadda is just never fun, right? I mean, it was the worst level in Dark Forces 1. Well possibly the worst, but even in games that I actually really like, like Knights of the Old Republic, I still hate going to this place. And this version of it just sucks. The environments are just weird and convoluted for no damn reason, making the combat here just terrible. It all feels so slow and clunky, with enemies just appearing out of nowhere at times. I mean, the whole first portion can be summed up with these plain corridors just mowing down grands. Everything is just so bland looking and even the secret locations are just pitiful and boring. The rest of the game is such high quality that starting here is just such a terrible first impression. I mean running around this cargo bay and shooting these ugly bastards is just not nearly as fun as stealing the Death Star plans in the first mission of Dark Forces 1. For a game that is known for some intriguing and interesting level designs, this first level is just such a turn off. I mean, I'd put it on par with Paragus for one of the worst intros to good games. Fortunately, the first half of Nar Shaddaa goes by pretty quickly, and we catch up to AT-88 as he tries to flee from our alien massacre. Leaving so soon? Fuck yeah, Kyle, blow his head off. Okay, that shuttle has guns all over it. Come on, AT-88, think for a minute. Nice looking Thai bomber though. Oh, whenever I need to find you, you're always in some kind of trouble. Ah, Jan Ors. Kyle's kinda sorta girlfriend. It's complicated. In the first Dark Forces game, she was mostly just the advisor who gave you mission briefs between levels. However, in this game she actually serves a bit more of an important role to the story, and her actress does a very good job with Kyle's to give off a really just fun performance. <laughs> Somehow I don't see content or an old man. So much for the relaxing chat. Jan, meet me at the top, I've got to get that disc! So AT-88's arm fell off the ledge, and it has Morgan Katarn's data disc. And here's where Narshada somehow gets both better and way worse at the same time somehow, starting off with just getting the disc. It has fallen far below to a place you think you wouldn't be able to survive falling to. I mean, that's a pretty big drop. But after spending a couple minutes topside trying to figure out an actual pathway down there, what do you know, it turns out you literally were supposed to just jump down there. Kind of a strange level design choice, but once you're actually down there, you encounter possibly the worst enemy in the entire game. More Grands, but this time with Thermal Detonators. Now, Grands with Thermal Detonators were already irritating enough in Dark Forces 1, but now you'll be facing these jackasses in small areas with no room to maneuver whatsoever. And to add to the bullshit, they even have the Martyrdom perk activated, so sometimes they'll actually drop live grenades when they die. 
kind of ridiculous. Look out! Well, thank you for the heads up. Oh God, we got Gamorians again. Now is probably a good time to probably mention the damage system in Dark Forces 2. It's still pretty much the same as it was in Dark Forces 1, with blasters taking out your shields first and melee going right through your shields and directly draining your health. And I'm glad they decided to keep this system because it worked out really well in the first game and it still works out really well here. Ah shit, I'm out of ammo again. I swear this really isn't much of a problem later on in the game, but for the first few levels here, ammo is just always a constant concern. You can alleviate it just a little bit by exploring more and finding a couple secret stashes, but to be honest, I was having to throw hands quite a bit until I actually got the lightsaber. I'm pretty sure for the first few levels, I died due to running out of ammo more than anything else. I should probably also point out, this playthrough is on medium, and believe me, medium is hard enough for me in this game. Not only does increasing the difficulty affect the enemy's damage and health, but it also changes the amount of enemies you'll be facing. Now to be honest, I had a hard enough time with this game on normal, so I don't know what the hell those of you who've actually beaten this game on hard are doing. Now one of the good things about this second part of Narshada is getting to play around with some of the more fun and dynamic puzzles and platforming the game has. Here pretty much everything is based around the cargo bay design, so there are a lot of containers moving all around, and I especially really like the part where you're jumping back and forth from containers as you try to climb your way up the loading bay. Some of the other ones are more simple, like jumping from some moving machinery or running around through conveyor belts, but if Dark Forces 2 does one thing right, is it makes some really interesting set pieces just to puzzle your way through. Though sometimes they can go just a little too far with it. Oh come on, what the hell? For fuck's sake, is this grenade chucking bastard the final boss here or something? Finally, no more Narshada. So apparently at some point in that mission we got pretty wounded. More than likely because of all those damn thermal detonators. But while being knocked out, Cal actually has a force vision of Kuran. Your path is at a moment of change. Jarek, the man who murdered your father, is a great evil. He searches for the location of a sacred place, the Valley of the Jedi. A force of thousands of Jedi is trapped here. If Jarek captures this power, he will be a creature such as the universe has never seen. A supernova of stars in a fleeting I love Kyle's face during this explanation. Like, eh, trap souls of thousands of Jedi? Hmm. Oh, interesting. Please, go on, Mr. Force Guy, who up till now I've never actually met. I mean, really think about it. Kyle's putting an awful lot of faith in a vision from some random guy. He might as well have just said, Yo, trust me, bro. I used to know your old man. The disc you have in your possession will lead you to the ways of the Jedi. Remember, it will be your path to the ways of the Force. Well, your blessed ship is going to be in the repair bay for the next few days. Uh, how's it look? Nothing that a crate full of money which you don't have wouldn't solve. Like always, I owe you. Can you take care of her for me? You're not going after Jarek, are you? No. I'm going back to my father's home in Sulan. Can you meet me there when you're finished with the crow? Of course. Is everything okay? I don't know. I'll find out when I get there. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I love those old 90s transition effects. Oh 
oh my god, this cutscene is still going. I mean, I love the cheesy story, but damn. That was the last of them. Now what do we do? 8088 will decipher them at Baron's head. <laughs> fuck! What the fuck is up with that dude? Just shambling around here like a jockey from Left 4 Dead. You know, a fun part about these early games is actually seeing just how much the lore has actually changed over the years. For example, through most of this level you're actually fighting sand people, and for those of you who actually took the time to talk to the wise Tuscan Elder and Knights of the Old Republic, you might be wondering how the hell are Tuscans on a different planet traveling and serving with a dark Jedi, and why are they using bowcasters like Wookiees? Well, in Star Wars Legends these are Grave Tuscans a swoop bite gang of mercenaries recruited by the Dark Jedi Maul. And no, not Maul with an L, but Maul with a W. This dude from the beginning, actually. Also, if you ever wanted to see what sand people look like, well, then here you go. Still pretty damn ugly, if you ask me. There's obviously more to their story, but this isn't a lore video, so instead of researching them, why don't we go back to just killing them instead. So the level starts off with us needing to find a way to get inside the house while being jumped by waves of Tuscans. This looks interesting. Hmm, that is really satisfying for some reason. Okay, what the hell is with all these pyramids in here? Fighting inside the house can be a little bit irritating at times due to how powerful that damn bowcaster can be. Lucky for me, a lot of older games like this one actually have usable inventory items that can actually help you out. Now for all you youngsters out there, most 90s shooters actually had inventory systems for items like night vision, flares, or in this case back to tanks that can be used to instantly get back 30 points of health. Now, I unfortunately didn't realize this until I was a few more missions in, making the first one third of the game or so a lot more difficult than it needed to be. So as you progress further into Kyle's dad's house you find this dude was one crazy architect. I mean he has a fucking waterfall in his house for god's sake. I mean that's awesome but at the same time absolutely ridiculous. Now Dark Forces 2 will sometimes try to switch things up and have you find objects like wrenches instead of car keys to give you kind of the illusion of variety to the at this time aging concept of key hunting. However, to be honest, this is still kind of just such a step back from the Dark Forces 1 system they created. You see, Dark Forces 1 really took things to the next level by having you find Imperial codes that you manually had to enter to open up certain areas, which though it might kind of seem kind of simple now, for that era of gaming it was crazy advanced. But Dark Forces 2 kind of just goes back to the hunting down what are effectively keys with different names, which is slightly disappointing but still kind of just par for the course for a mid 90s game so I have a hard time giving it too much grief over it. Ugh, Maalox. These bug like guys are just all over these next few areas. Luckily they are kind of weak but they can sometimes get the jump on you if you're not careful. Ugh, son of a bitch there's a lot of these guys. This has got to be bad for my health. So after jumping across what looks like electrified lava, we finally make it over to our dad's room. My father's workshop. Ouija has got to be in here.
Hey, it's Dad! This message is intended for my son, Kyle Katan. Kyle, I have left two very important items for you. The first is a map to the Valley of the Jedi, and is embedded in the stone ceiling above this room. Well, that's convenient. The last is a lightsaber that once belonged to a friend and great Jedi, Ran. Use it well. Use it for good. Okay, I know someone's gonna say it. How can Kyle just know how to use the lightsaber and the force? And, I mean, you're kinda right. I mean, don't get me wrong, if a human racing pods is a sign of the force, then I imagine me punching to death a Kel Dragon with my bare hands is also a sign. I mean, Darth Vader did imply at the end of Dark Forces 1 that you were force sensitive, so, eh, there you go. The force is strong with Katarn. Uh, foreshadowing. Back then times were a little simpler and the rule of fun always ended up winning out. And the lightsaber is actually really fun. I mean, melee weapons back then could be a little finicky at times, but here the lightsaber is surprisingly good. One slash should be able to kill most enemies, and so long as you're looking right at them, the lightsaber should automatically block most blaster fire. Now you still definitely can be taken out if you accidentally show your sides or your back to the enemy, and given how these level designs are, especially here, that can actually happen pretty easily, making the lightsaber not just an automatic god mode. In fact, there were many areas of the game where I still went back and just used blasters because of just how effective they were, which is a really good thing because it makes the lightsaber your main go-to weapon without just rendering everything else useless. Either way, we are still stuck in good old dad's house. Now, I would kind of think with a lightsaber we would be able to just cut our way through the main door, but I guess instead, Kyle would rather go through the irrigation system and try to sneak on out. The irrigation channels are my way out of here. It is actually a pretty cool feature to cut your way through the bars with the lightsaber, and is something that you'll actually have to do in future levels, not just to get through it, but to also be able to find most of the secret areas. Now, I gotta be honest, I find this whole irrigation section to just be kind of strange. It's really just kind of a lot of sprinting down waterways, trying not to get shot from all sides. Eventually, we get to this long platforming section of jumping from bar to bar while Malex swarm you, and then what do you know, we're right back into the irrigation system. It just kind of seems like one of those levels that feels like every portion of it was made independently from one another and kind of just thrown together last minute. I will admit, the part where you have to actually increase the water levels and outswim the giant jellyfish was kinda neat, and definitely really hit at my megalohydrolassophobia, or fear of large sea creatures. Like, really, I'm actually a certified scuba diver, but things like this just really fuck with me for some reason. Fortunately, after that whole ordeal, we're back on solid ground blasting our way through Tuscans. Ah, oh, fuck, another one. So, after fighting our way through the irrigation systems, we finally unlock our first stars. Stars are pretty much what's used to upgrade and choose your force powers. You're able to unlock them by finishing certain missions, or you can unlock extras by finding every secret on any given level, which I most certainly did not do in this playthrough. The force powers are split up into three sections. Light side powers like healing, persuade, blinding, absorb, and protection. Neutral powers like jump, speed, sight, and pull. And dark side powers like throw, grip, lightning, destruction, and deadly sight. This is also where you can actually see your current alignment based on how you've been playing the game. If you kill innocence or kill using dark side powers, it brings you further down to the dark side. And because of this, I didn't actually really mess too much with the dark side powers wanting to have a more light side playthrough, but to be honest, the light and neutral powers are more than strong enough, especially after I eventually discovered I could use force pull to just disarm enemies then just beat them to death while they're running around helplessly. 
That actually sounded kind of dark saying it like that. Sure knows how to ruin a perfectly good city. My guess is your palliate eight is in that large house. The Imperials are guarding it like a fortress. Well, I think a visit's in order. Don't you? So our goal is to try to find a way to sneak inside the city and then eventually break into the tower that. Okay, so as I was saying, we need to get into the city and break into the tower that 88 is hiding in. You know, one thing that's kind of funny here is that even though by today's standards the city levels are rather small, originally level 5 and 6 here were meant to be actually the same level, but due to the immense size and portions of the levels they actually had to be split, causing a pretty abrupt transition between the two levels. Now overall, the first part of the town is actually a pretty interesting set piece for the time. I mean, yeah, it's a little strange with how it's set up architecturally speaking, but running through a mercenary controlled town with the citizens just asking for your help is pretty fun, especially when you can look around and see all the little shops they have set up and everything. Whoops. Should have stayed out of the way. Now I would be remiss if I did not mention this level also has one of the best LucasArts easter eggs in it as well. With some careful timing you can actually enter this house and find Max from the Sam and Max games just chilling on his own with his briar pistol ready by his side. And for those of you who don't know, Sam and Max was a comic series back from the 80s that LucasArts eventually made into a game around 1993 or so. And while LucasArts had Sam and Max easter eggs in nearly all of their games including Dark Forces 1, this particular easter egg seeing Max run around slaughtering mercenaries has got to be the best. Happening. Hey. Hey. Oh look at this, nice little karaoke bar, yeah, that's pretty neat. Alright let's get going. Alright, move please, please move. Oh, come on, damn it. Move! For fuck's sake, if only he listened. Is that a probe droid out here? As fun as the first part of the city is, the start of level 6 is really just not nearly as fun. You start by first going through the destroyed parts of the city, very reminiscent of the second level in Dark Forces 1. And the design is actually really cool, seeing probe droids just float around through the rubble to attack you, I mean it's really neat. However, the level really does make very little sense. Earlier I mentioned how some levels can sometimes feel like two people created them separately and just kind of Frankenstein them together. And these levels are probably the worst offenders of this. I mean, the level itself is fine, but the flow between the bustling city to just the immediate destruction of one seems to just come out of nowhere. And what the hell are with all the mines everywhere? I mean, literally, it's just, they're everywhere. There was one mine in particular I spent like 10 minutes trying to get past since you can only actually set them off with other explosives and I was pretty much all out of thermal detonators clearing out all the other mines. I mean I literally lost count of how many deaths I had trying to clear this one in particular.
fucking finally. Now to actually get through this level. Motherfucker. Alright, an early repeater rifle. Really, not much has changed about it since Dark Forces 1, with it still firing quickly, staggering most enemies, and taking up the same cell ammo that the bowcaster and concussion rifle take. You know, watching this back, I'm pretty sure I didn't actually have to destroy all these docked probe droids, but eh, what the hell. This is at least where we finally get to meet our first stormtroopers, and I actually really do like how they're introduced here. Is this a drill or something? I have no idea. Did someone tell you that? No, we just haven't had any drills in a while. Stormtroopers. Set blasters on full. Drop your <laughs> I mean, six levels in, it's about time we get to kill some of these guys. So, I really hope there are more of them around here. Oh. Well, that is a big tower. So, remember when I said that level 5 and 6 were supposed to be one big level, but they had to split it up due to its size? Well, this arena right here is like 90% of that problem. I mean, it is huge. You have so many Imperial Troopers, ATSTs walking about, even TIE Bombers flying around. I mean, this is seriously impressive for a game from 1997. I will say though, make sure you have force speed, because I'll be honest, I cannot imagine running around here without it. Hey, they're like the Servitors from Dark Tide. So after running around slaughtering Stormtroopers for what felt like forever, I did eventually find my way in, however... Here's something that I really don't fully understand about this game at times. Dark Forces 2 gives you the choice of buying force powers between missions, which is nice. You know, you can choose or not choose whatever you like, but here's the catch. Some levels really seem like they actually require force speed or force jump to get past them. So if you mistakenly put your points somewhere else or chose to save them for other powers, you're pretty much just kind of screwed. I mean, take this bridge here. You have to flip these two switches and run around to it before the timer goes off and the bridge starts sliding back in. Now, it is possible to get up here without force powers. However, I couldn't figure out a way to do it, so there was just no way in hell I was going to pull that off. Plus, if you go and look at any walkthrough of the game, all you find is videos of people just saying use force speed. So if you don't have it, again, it just kind of feels like you're screwed. Fortunately, I do like force speed and force jump, so I got through it no problem, but just know if you forego these powers, you're going to be in for a much more frustrating playthrough. So here's the first part of the game that actually really stumped me. So you got two gates you can open and a locked room with no clear way in. And I legit spent like 20 minutes jumping around this thing trying to figure out how to even get in there. And eventually, I thought I actually had found it out after I accidentally uncovered a vent that just frustratingly brought me back to the spot I was before. Wait a second, I've been here already. God damn it! So after some meditation and just really thinking about it, I finally realized what I needed to do was actually hop in the gate as it rose up to actually get into the ceiling. So after one stupid failed attempt later, I was finally in. Hey Jarek, if you don't mind, we really need you to kind of ham this scene up a bit. Excellent, AT. The Valley of the Jedi will soon be mine. Your payment is waiting for you at one of my cargo ships. Meet it at the refueling station outside of Baron's Head. I should have aimed for your head when I had the chance. A lost opportunity. I want the map, 88. All yours, Kyle. Oh damn, look at this badass. Heh, 
Yeah, never mind. In all my years, I've only known Dark Jedi, never one from the light side. Somehow, I expected more. You know, I kind of feel like his acting is just a little bit too try-hard. You know, kind of like he's actually hoping that he's going to score some major role after this or something. Like, everyone else kind of seems like they're having fun with it all and just kind of loose, but his just feels like he's taking things just a little bit too seriously for a game like this. Yan, a young and willing dark Jedi, the newest addition to the cause. Brash and eager, he is ready to prove himself to his master at any cost. These elements make him a dangerous and unpredictable foe. So at the beginning of each boss fight, Q Ron will actually narrate a little something about the person you're about to fight, usually telling you something about their past, as well as maybe a tidbit about how they normally fight and what maybe they're weak against as well. It's kind of a good way to actually explain the history of these characters without it being too intrusive, so I'll be honest, I actually really like it. Either way, this is our first real boss fight against the weakest of the Dark Jedi, Yun. Now, the lightsaber combat in this game is actually pretty competent, actually way more so than I was coming in expecting. You will automatically block most strikes while facing your opponent, unless you just swing for the fences and are deflected yourself, causing most of the fights to be more about outmaneuvering and outtiming your opponent. Learning how to better utilize your force powers will end up helping you get the upper hand in many of these fights, with of course it becoming more and more effective as you unlock better force powers. However, at the same time, the Dark Jedi you'll be fighting will also have new force powers, making sure you're kind of always kept on your toes. Now, for Yun, his main powers are blinding and persuasion, which persuasion in this game actually just makes you invisible. Funny thing is, is that all of Yun's powers are actually light side powers, not dark side powers, which is kind of strange for a dark Jedi to have. Now, the negative thing about this fight, for me at least, was that I was stupid and didn't invest anything into foresight, so I have no way of seeing him when he actually goes invisible. But despite that, he's still pretty easy to defeat. Quick, kill him while he's down, Kyle. Kill him, kill him. Kill me. Is that what you do to Dark Jedi? Damn straight. Oh, never mind. Uh, I guess we're being nice today. Got it. I mean, we can't have Jedi Kyle just going around killing defenseless people, I guess. I mean, I get it, it's Star Wars and Jedis are supposed to be forces for good, so killing him would seem a little off, but what about the hundreds of troopers I literally just killed? Or the multiple nukes I set off in the first game? Uh, oh well, either way, now we still actually need to escape this palace. And to do so, we're going to actually head up over to the roof, which is being bombed by ties for some reason. I mean, it's really cool, but just why? I have to say, this palace seems a lot taller than it was earlier. Now, kind of like I mentioned before, this is another spot that if you don't have force jump, you might just kind of feel like you're, well, screwed. Almost every walkthrough out there I found basically just says force jump on up to continue forward, and that is exactly what I did. However, if you were dumb and didn't get force jump like I told you to, then there is a hidden path off to the side here that will let you climb up. But just get force jump, it makes everything just so much easier throughout this game. So after jumping up on top of the building and accidentally falling to what I thought was going to be my death, only to bounce off into the vent I was apparently supposed to go into, I ended up running into what I think might be the most embarrassing moment I had throughout this entire playthrough. You see, eventually you fight your way over to these elevators, and after I climbed out, I looked over and saw the other elevators moving and thought, oh, I must just need to ride it down. Except if you rewind real quick... There's literally a vent right next to me I'm supposed to proceed through. Instead, I ended up spending like 10 minutes just jumping onto the other elevator, seeing it led to nowhere, then noticing a door with a panel on it with a ledge and thinking that, oh, I just need to actually jump over there and land on that ledge, open the door, and I'm good to go. 
So I proceeded to kill myself over and over and over again thinking man I must just really suck at platforming. This went on for longer than I care to admit. Eventually, I did actually just break down and look on YouTube for help, only to find out, yeah, I'm kind of just an idiot. You gotta be fucking kidding me, it really was just right here all along. <sighs> so I kind of just ended up turning off the game for the night after that one. Fortunately, the next day I was back making progress once more. And I also eventually did find some elevators I was supposed to jump across, and let's just say I had plenty of experience at it at this point. Besides my own stupidity, the level is actually still pretty neat with some interesting platforming, and it's also the first level that actually introduces you to the rocket troopers. So the rockets and dark forces aren't like most rocket launchers. In fact, they actually act more like the torque bows from Gears of War. Man, I really do miss that game. The missiles actually embed themselves into whatever they hit, including yourself, making them definitely a weapon to be feared. After making our way around the edges of the palace and nearly falling to our death when AT-88 ship actually flies away, Jan comes in with the Moldy Crow to pick us up so we can follow him. Man, my dude has lost an arm and still hasn't been paid. Now AT-88 has gone onto a cargo ship and once more we have to try and sneak in to find him. Which has pretty much made this become a running theme here, just sneak in and try to find 88 over and over and over again. You know, as fun as the story might actually be overall, this is starting to get just a little repetitive of just basically doing the same general task just in a different area every time. But either way, we decide to hop onto the refueling station to try to sneak aboard the cargo ship and the refueling station level is actually a pretty neat level, though it does have those bullshit concussion rifle wielding Trandoshans all over again. I swear, they weren't fun to fight in Dark Forces 1, and even though they are a little better here due to there being just less of them, I gotta be honest, I still hate these bastards. The problem with them is still pretty much the same as it was in Dark Forces 1, where you basically have a hit scan, explosive, area effect style weapon, which is just impossible pretty much to dodge at times. But hey, we also get to see some Ugnaughts here. These ugly little bastards kind of do nothing but just hop in the way of blaster fire and for some reason really enjoy sitting on explosive barrels. You don't belong. Fortunately for me, despite them being technically innocent, the game actually puts them in the same level as droids, so you're pretty much free to massacre them without receiving any dark side points whatsoever. This one's for 3PO. For the most part, the fueling station level is really less about combat and instead focuses a lot more about the puzzles. The first real one you'll face is actually having to transfer fuel out of a giant fuel container and then having to search through and locate a key in order to get inside and then go through it. The leveling out of the fuel portion is easy enough and the key really shouldn't take too long to find, but you also gotta remember, I'm an idiot. So after entering the fuel chamber, I couldn't understand why the hell this door wouldn't just open. I mean, I did everything it asked for. I moved the fuel while dodging these god-awful concussion rifles, I found the hidden key, and nothing. 
I tried swimming in the field to see if there was a hidden area underneath. I tried jumping up the chamber only to find out this is all I had to do. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Yes, it turned out all I had to do was shut the first door before going to open the second. That's literally it. And I know someone's gonna say, but barbecue, how could you have missed something so simple? But hear me out here. At no point in the game is it ever required to close the door behind you before opening the next. So I don't know why you would ever think this would be the natural solution here. <sighs> it is pretty cool how the fuel actually blows up when you shoot it though. That is a neat touch. All right, down the elevator. Kill this jackass. Oh yeah, let's check for any secrets. You're right. Okay, nothing. All right, let's get out of here. Come on. Oh god, I hear it coming down. No, 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 damn it! Well, that's fucking great. So we drain some more fuel, hop in another fuel line, say what's up Doug, not number 37, and now sludge our way through more explosive fuel. Not going to lie, there is something kind of cool about wading through the fuel lines knowing that any stray blaster shot could actually set off just a full chain reaction. And you know, this is something that Dark Forces 2 really does excel at. It might be all over the place level wise at times, but as far as the game goes, it really does go above and beyond and trying to give you new and interesting set pieces that in most cases end up one upping what came before. Their designs might not always make the most sense, but I really have to admire the sheer ambition they had when creating most of these levels. Hey, it looks like I got a little ugnut buddy to ride the elevator with. Man, dude, you are so ugly. Yo, man, what are you doing? Dude, be careful, you might slide out. Dude, just get away from there, you're gonna... Oh. So as we reach the top, the ship actually starts trying to take off without us. However, we decide to leap aboard, this time not allowing AT-88 to escape again. It is a pretty cool way to end a level with us jumping onto the ship at the very last moment and makes good use of the movable geometry they've created for this game. Now after actually boarding the ship, we have to actually try to make our way through and find AT-88. And even though the cargo ship doesn't really offer much new gameplay wise, I did start really enjoying it all thanks to finding out apparently force pull can be used to disarm stormtroopers. <laughs> More defenseless victims to kill. Okay, so you don't actually get dark side points for killing defenseless enemies, but it really feels like you probably should. Most of the level is pretty straightforward, just finding keys, killing stormtroopers, and riding a lot of elevators, all to locate AT-88 shuttle. And for the most part, like I said before, this is probably one of your more standard levels of the game with only a few original set pieces in it. But hey, we found this shuttle and we can finally at last deal with this prick. Where is that busted head? I finally get my chance to repay you. Lovely, yes. Our master is on his way to the Valley of the Jedi as we speak. A fortune you will not be so lucky to experience. Oh, come on. I've been tracking this dude for half the goddamn game, and I don't even get to kill him myself. It is a mystery why one would call Gork and Pig twins. Even though one is a miniature version of the other, they look nothing alike. They also don't battle alike. Pick is the energy and Gork the counter. They are the clashing balance of opposites. One the voice, the other the body. This combination is deadly. 
But okay, this is Gork and Pick, probably the two Dark Jedis I personally just despise the most. Apparently, they were both mutated by some Sith experiment and now share a force bond because of it. Gork was originally a normal Gamorrean, and Pick, whose full name is Pickaroon C. Boodle, say that ten times really fast, was a Kowokian monkey lizard. Or, I guess, just the freaky monkey thing that was in Jabba's palace. <laughs> really, Gork isn't too bad, besides his ability to just force choke the damn life out of you. But overall, he's kind of slow and easy to dodge and get around to take out. It's Pick who is the real problem here. I am not exaggerating when I say Pick was the hardest boss in the entire game for me. I mean, all he really does is just go invisible, and unlike my fight with Yun, I actually do have Force Vision now, so that portion isn't that big of a deal. But he's just so damn quick, and his hitbox is so low, you can barely fucking hit the dude. It's like trying to fight Gon in Tekken. It's just unfair. I tried turning on auto-aim to see if that would help with hitting him, but apparently that doesn't actually work with lightsabers. Literally my only saving grace in this entire fight was Pix AI is just so fucking stupid at times, like not being able to use the lift properly, or better yet, getting stuck on the level geometry. Is it the honorable way to beat him? No. But you know what? After spending that long and being killed by him that many times, I really don't give a damn. Plus, I did just spend the entire last level killing defenseless stormtroopers with my bare hands, so I kind of think I probably threw out my honor long ago. So, after the fight, we need to make our way back to the top of the cargo ship to evac. And you might think, of course, we can just go back the way we came, but no, this is Dark Forces 2, and the level designers just had some cool ideas they really had just to throw in for us. Ideas like confusing dark cargo rooms with floors that will just kill you. Or confusing elevator rooms, which require multiple key cards. Or, my personal favorite, a weird generator room with red visuals implying of course it will hurt you if you walk into it, making you waste your time to try and find ways to turn it off, only to find out of course that all you really need to do is just walk through it because it doesn't actually harm you at all. I mean, just why? Why do I have to ride so many elevators? Why do I have to activate each of these platforms manually? Why is this level needed in the first place? It's not that long or anything, it just feels pointless. I think that should do it, Ouija. So after scanning 8T88's memory logs, we now have the location for the Valley of the Jedi. Unfortunately, so does Jarek and his band of misfits. The valley is being prepared for you, my lord. Very good, Saris. <laughs> Ugh, for fuck's sake, dude, just stop with the weird.
I can see Jarek's men. They've already gotten their hooks into this place. I've got to get to the top of that tower. You're just gonna get into more trouble. That's when you bail me out. Now, as Kyle said, we have to get to the top of that fortified tower because this game just loves itself some verticality. At least for the most part, the beginning of this level does it correctly in the way this early canyon segment is actually all laid out. It kind of reminds me of the beginning of the hidden base level in Dark Forces 1 without the pain of a simple fall instantly killing you. In this case, you actually have multiple paths you can take from sticking to the default one, using force jump to just get to the higher levels, or by just swimming upstream down below. It's a pretty good short segment that kind of gives you the illusion that you're really deciding how you're really going to go about this, even though of course there are a couple switches that you have to go to in order to proceed. After taking out a couple small outposts in the canyon, we actually get a pretty cool shot of an ATSD patrolling on a bridge that we obviously are going to have to eventually cross. And oh god, the water has weird shark things in it. Ugh. God, I hate water monsters. All right, let's take on that ATST. Four speed, bitch. Ah, shit. Why are there mines here? Uh, okay, let's try that again. Okay, take out the mines first this time. And done. ATSTs are pretty weak once you get the rocket launcher. Man, that is a lot of firepower behind that shield. But hey, want to see something funny? Force pull actually works even through shields, so all you gotta do is get them to get a little close and no gun for you, no gun for you, no gun for you, no gun for all of you. <laughs> I'll come back and kill all of y'all later. Now in typical Dark Forces fashion, it did take me a while to actually find the proper route to go through. But eventually I did find the hidden grate that was under the elevator that actually takes you right under the shields. Now one weird thing about this little area here is that this is actually one of the few portions of the game that actually has an infinite spawner for stormtroopers. So you're kind of just stuck having to either run right through it or using force pull to just disarm all the stormtroopers effectively taking them out of the fight without causing any more to spawn. But after making our way through those stormtroopers, we find an elevator that will actually get us to the top of the tower, and more importantly, to Jarek's shuttle. Finally, I get to wipe your putrid taste from the force. Okay, am I the only one who thinks his voice just does not match his body at all? To the one called Maul. A bitter individual that loathes all and holds loyalty to few. A strong and formidable foe. For every cord of muscle there is hatred. It is this hate that keeps his aging body strong. Okay, so let me just get this straight for a minute. This is an alien Sith named Maul, similar to of course Darth Maul from Episode 1. He was cut in half like Darth Maul, and is only alive thanks to his hatred being so strong it keeps him that way, like Darth Maul. I mean, what the fuck? Did Lucas and the Clone Wars writers just steal this character's traits and just graft them onto Maul? Because that's kind of a lot of coincidences to have. Now, fortunately, his backstory is where his comparisons to Maul ends, because he's not really that strong. Really, once you get used to how he moves and attacks, he's not that bad whatsoever, at least nowhere near as bad as Picaroon C. Boodle, that's for sure. The interesting thing here, though, is that this is the only fight in the game that's actually split up into separate portions, where after inflicting enough damage, he kind of just floats away to the next stage of the fight. However, despite this gimmick, again, he is really easy. In fact, the only time I actually died was when I accidentally ran off the edge once. <laughs> Weaponless. <laughs> Kill me! 
You can't, can you? You're weak like a father. I remember it. <laughs> Jarek. He gave him a sweet, slow death. A death worthy of a coward! <laughs> Damn, dude has no chill. I had the honor taking his head and thrusting it on a spike for all to see. <laughs> okay, that dude needed to die, right? Like, I know he's unarmed and, well, unlegged, but there should be no conflict here whatsoever. I mean, that dude was clearly a monster. I mean, I know I lost this fight, but let me tell you how I took your father's head and shoved it on a spike and showed it to everyone. I mean, what the fuck is with this dude? Excellent, Catan. You've started your journey to the dark side. But that is not enough. Looks like I can't bail you out of trouble this time. Strike her down and realize your true destiny as a dark Jedi, your true power. Why? I mean, come on, she's the best looking girl here and she's done me no wrong whatsoever. Why on earth would I want to kill her? One thing I will say is that I actually really like the fact that this decision right here isn't yours to make. And what I mean by that is that if you've been killing civilians or using a ton of dark side powers in your gameplay, you will actually split off here, killing Jan and taking the dark side path regardless if you want to or not. Now, from my playthrough, I did none of this, so, well, we'll go forward with the light side canon ending for right now, and I'll talk about the other one afterwards. But so many games let you be pretty much a complete jackass throughout the entire thing, and then when the moment comes, you can kind of go, no, I'm going to be the boy scout after all. So I kind of actually enjoy the fact that it's depending on how you've played up to this point that decides which way you go. Also, once it's set that you've gone the light side route, you'll no longer be able to purchase any dark side powers going forward. And yes, I know my force power distribution here really kind of sucks, so no need to let me know in the comments below please, it was my first playthrough, I didn't fully understand how effective all the powers are until the very end, so I kind of made the game a little bit harder on myself. Either way, after not killing Jan, Jarek launches a force bomb at us like something out of Dragon Ball, blasting us back into his shuttle as it falls, queuing up possibly the most technically impressive level of the entire game. This right here absolutely shocked me. I mean, I was already pretty impressed with some of the things that the Sith game engine was capable of, but running through a falling shuttle as you find your captured ship while racing the timer is crazy impressive for the time this game came out. I mean, this is just a really unique perspective, having just everything blowing up around you, stormtroopers being squashed by falling crates, and it even has multiple pathways that you can take to actually make it to your ship. It's just shocking that this would be in a game this old. They actually even have secret routes you can take where you can do things like activating the shuttle's engine so it will actually delay the fall even more, giving you more time to just look around. I mean, this whole level is just nuts. Such a bad fall, but you'll be glad to know I found your lightsaber. <laughs> oh dear God, it's you. Want it? <gasps> Very distinctive. Oh. <sighs> oh. 
For fuck's sake, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Not so distinctive now, is it? <laughs> Enough of this. All right, Kmart, Sharon Stone, what the hell are you Tell up to? Jarek that this Jedi will soon join the dead. Uh, oops. <laughs> A battle. Yoon, I love you, but acting really isn't for you. Out of all the dark Jedi I have met, Ceres is the one I can say I fear. Powerful, strong in both the physical and mental arenas of the Force, she is a master, a perfectionist, quiet and reserved. And ugly. This Ugh. makes her a very dangerous foe. So Ron tells us Saris is the one he truly fears, which is kind of funny to me considering that she was one of the few Dark Jedis I didn't really have any problems with. Now she does have a dark side power called Deadly Sight, which once activated hurts you so long as you're within her vision. However, once you understand how this power works, she really isn't that bad. Just pick up Yun's lightsaber and pace out your slashes and she goes down easily enough. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude, please stop being such a freak. So the next three levels are about reclimbing this damn tower again and actually descending into the Valley of the Jedi inside. And even though at this point in the game I was kind of just ready to kill Jarek already, I mean just look how long this video has been going on for, right? it's a pretty long game. But despite this, Dark Forces 2 wasn't quite done impressing me with some of its level designs. I mean the first part did kind of feel like more of the same because it's really just reclimbing the same tower I was already up. I mean hell I didn't even bother beating to death defenseless stormtroopers instead just choosing to run my way through. I will say however the grav lift section was kind of interesting but fuck that vent jumping I mean damn it is just so finicky and just rarely seems to work as intended. Overall, level 17 is just kind of forgettable since you're pretty much just redoing what you've already done again and again and again at this point. However, level 18 actually plays a lot more to Dark Force's strength, using verticality in a more fun and interesting way as you descend through the Imperial base to locate the excavation site and the entrance to the Valley of the Jedi. And I'm actually just kind of realizing this as I'm looking through the footage here. Jarek has only just recently found a location of the Valley of the Jedi, so how the hell is this large of an operation already down here? Oh well, the descent down is definitely more maze-like compared to some of the other levels and required me to really just run around through the same areas a few times until I actually got my bearings straight. 
One of the interesting things about the level, however, is you go down each level by actually escorting down a large crate, causing the locked doors to open for you to actually jump through, creating some really interesting platforming moments as well. Eventually, we do reach the bottom of the base and find the whole excavation site itself, which is just filled to the brim with rocket troopers. Man, these guys do not play around. The inside of the valley is pretty simplistic, but actually matches the theming of the level quite well. And hey, what's this? Okay, now this is a pretty cool callback to the first Dark Forces game. But of course, this time instead of having to punch them to death like the Doom Slayer himself, I actually have a more elegant weapon to slaughter them with. I, I do have to say this, the Crate Dragon Room looks pretty metal compared to most Star Wars things. I mean, it literally has arms and severed heads everywhere. Ah, of course, we gotta have a final puzzle. The idea is just to open up the pathway while having the weights at the right level so you can still run across them later. It's nothing really that crazy, but it does give kind of a good break before the level's, I guess you could say, mini boss. A final ATST, which at this point of the game is just not a big deal at all. On a quick side note, at the end of each level, they actually give you like a little Jedi rank, starting of course at Apprentice, Padawan, then goes up to of course Jedi, Jedi Knight, Jedi Master, and at this point in the game, it gives you the rank of Jedi Lord, which is something I have never seen in any other Star Wars game. Funny thing, however, they did actually eventually canonize the idea of Jedi Lords, with it becoming apparently a title used by ancient Jedis who used to rule over entire planets. So, yeah, kind of a nice little tidbit there. This is going to cost you a great load of money you don't have. As long as I'm around to pay you, I don't care. My sentiments exactly. Mine too! <laughs> I can't abide this creature named Bok. He is one of the few that actually uses two lightsabers in battle. He is a crude individual that lacks both tact and teeth. Only a dark Jedi can he be. <laughs> so finally we get to fight the mad Twi'lek himself and my god does he literally fight like a madman. Just constantly hopping around non-stop like Yoda from episode 2 while just laughing maniacally at you. On top of that, he also has the force power of destruction, which pretty much allows him to just Kamehameha you whenever you get too far away from him. I mean, that power is strong and will take you down so quickly, so it's best to try to stay as close as you can to him. Good part is, there's actually a pathway off to the side that has health as well as force buffs. Plus, the tight hallways keep some pretty closed in so he can never use force destruction in the first place. Now I'm not gonna lie, Bach really tested my patience here, and it's mostly my fault because it was at this point I actually kind of realized I did a terrible job at selecting my force powers. Instead picking things like jump, pull, and healing instead of anything that would actually help me in direct combat with a dark Jedi. Meaning I had to pretty much just slowly whittle him down with my basic saber skills instead. Again, totally my fault, but definitely made these final two fights a little tougher than they probably should have been. However, after 15 minutes of trying, I finally ended this maniac's life. Just die already, you freak. His heavy brow overshadows the empty recesses that normally embrace eyes. Jarek has the uncanny power to absorb and overshadow one's connection to the Force. Like a dark cloud. A deep, empowering grasp of your will is what you need. 
You cannot defeat me. We are finally here. The final duel with Jarek, and, well, he definitely makes it a tough one. Not only does he have force destruction like Bach did, but he can also use lightning, which can just be crazy powerful. At least unlike some of these other duels, he's actually of normal height and doesn't just jump around the entire time, so hitting him isn't too bad so long as you can actually avoid his powers. Unfortunately, as you cut down his health, he'll just end up running into this central structure to heal while pulling these Jedi statues towards him. And if they make it to the center before you stop them, he will have become all powerful and it's pretty much just game over. Because of this, you'll actually have to activate the switches behind both statues, stopping them and disabling his healing. Then just float on up and start attacking him all over again. With all the force powers Jarek has at his disposal, as well as his ability to just heal during the fight, he makes for a really good final boss in the game. I mean, he's not as strong as the one and only Picaroon C. Boodle. I mean, that dude was clearly the true Dark Lord of the Sith. Now, I will say, it can be kind of easy to get caught up in a loop. I actually thought that after he healed a certain number of times, it wouldn't matter and he would just would eventually die, but this can pretty much go on indefinitely if you actually allow him to get to the central tower after he starts running away. Meaning, the only way you can really beat him is to kind of cheese it a bit, to be honest. Different people seem to have different strategies when it comes to this, some people lining up the grav lift with mines to hurt him as he goes up, and there's also apparently a very strong force power called Protect that actually makes you temporarily immune to damage so you can just kinda hack him down pretty easily, though my dumbass can never figure out how to actually unlock it, and because of this I actually chose to use Force Persuade to make myself invisible, that way he couldn't actually block any of my strikes. But no matter what strategy you choose, it all comes down to the same thing. When he runs away to heal, you have to cut him down before he makes it to that central tower. I am defenseless. Strike me down, and the power of the dark side will be yours. I'm sure you haven't forgotten. I was the one who murdered your father. Why do all of you want me to kill you so badly? I mean, it's like you have a death fetish or something. Oh yeah, because I can't kill a defenseless man. Except for all those times I killed those defenseless people. Is it just me, or is throwing a sword at your enemy's feet and saying, get up so I can beat you again, still kinda evil? Or at least morally gray? So after all of that, Kyle shows off his true talents by carving a beautiful sculpture of his father and Jedi Master Ron, honoring them both. And well, that's it. That is the canon, or now legends, ending for Dark Forces 2. However, I did say there was a dark side path, so why don't we go ahead and talk about that for a minute. All in all, the dark side path is very similar, almost to the point where it kind of just seems to have been an afterthought. However, there are a couple of interesting parts to it still. If you remember, the light and dark paths branch off at the decision on whether or not to kill Jan. Again, I'm not exactly sure why Dark Kyle would really want to kill Jan either, but oh well. Why do I need you, Jarek, when I can take all the power of the valley myself? A pity. Then you will die. Besides her blood-curdling stock audio scream, everything pretty much happens the same where Jarek knocks you into the falling ship, except this time when you fly off in your moldy crow, you actually don't crash and instead just jump straight into a rematch with Yun. 
And when I say straight into the rematch, I literally mean just straight into the rematch. No cutscene, no explanations, just nothing. Just, hey look, here's Yun, now kill him. Afterwards, the rest of the game kind of just plays out exactly the same, except for the final cutscene where you take up the mantle of Dark Lord and head back to your new throne room, and damn is it just so over the top. Oh yeah, and now Ceres is your main girl, not Jan. Quite the downgrade, if I'm being honest, but oh well. Our spies bring word of a small rebel uprising on Danuta. I have no time for petty uprisings. Extinguish them painfully. Yes, Emperor. Remember, son, when you're at the Academy, how very proud I am of you. So, yeah, the dark side path is an option, though one that was clearly added last minute based on just the lack of detail in it. And from the people I've talked to who played through this game back in the day, it seems like very few of them actually ever took the dark side path anyway, so it doesn't really matter. However, it still is a pretty cool feature to see in an FPS game this old. Dark Forces 2 is an interesting game to say the least. I mean, I don't even know if it's really fair to compare it to Dark Forces 1 given just how different the games are. At first, with how much I despise the first two levels, I would have said it's a massive downgrade of a game, but as it goes on, it really does come into its own. The lightsaber combat feels amazing for the time, and the fact that using guns is just as practical in most situations is pretty impressive. I mean, that's a hard balance to really reach. And the story, my god, the story was great and had me excited to see what would happen next. And I don't normally care for the whole live action cutscenes, but these were just so much fun to watch. Hell, I definitely enjoyed watching this Star Wars story more than anything Disney's been putting out. I know, I know, kind of a low bar, but this really does feel like it was made by people who just genuinely love the Star Wars universe and it shows. I really can't believe I put off playing this game for as long as I did because despite its poor start, Dark Forces 2 is just such a fun game overall and it might possibly now be in my top 10 favorite Star Wars games. I'll have to go back and probably replay a few of them to see how they stack up to be sure. Either way guys, thank you all so much for watching this admittedly long video. Unfortunately, I have been sick during the recording of all this, so hopefully my scratchy voice wasn't too bothersome for y'all. I'm trying to get better. Either way, if you've enjoyed this video, please of course make sure to like and subscribe, and if you're interested in more Dark Forces content, you can always check out my Dark Forces 1 retrospective I did over here to my left. It's about over a year old video, so it's not my best content, but yeah, it's still not bad if I do say so myself. But if that doesn't interest you, you can also, of course, always check out whatever YouTube's recommending over here to my right. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to be seeing you again real soon. Peace.